اي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته مساكم الله بالخير جميعا الزميلات والزملاء الاعزاء نرحب بكم في النشاط العلمي للجمعيه السعوديه للسعاده السنيه والتي تعتبر اول جمعيه كما تعلمون للتخصص في منطقه الخليج وتاسست قبل اشهر عديده لله الحمد قامت الجمعية بالعديد من الأنشطة وكذلك توقيع اتفاقيات تعاون مع جمعيات علمية مرموقة في التخصص كالجمعية الأمريكية للسعادة السنية والأكاديمية الأمريكية للسعادة السنية ثابتة وغيرها في الطريق بإذن الله بإذن الله ستكون أنشطة الجمعية مستمرة خلال هذه الفترة إلى ما قبل شهر رمضان بإذن الله وستكون محاضرات عن طريق المبدعين من الزميلات والزملاء في التخصص وكذلك سيتم دعوة عدد من المتحدثين العالميين المعروفين خلال الفترة القادمة بإذن الله لا أرغب الإطالة عليكم ولكن أتمنى من الجميع الحرص على دعم الجمعية فالجمعية جمعيتكم أنتم في الأول والأخير وذلك من خلال التسجيل في الجمعية عن طريق الموقع الإلكتروني والمشاركة في أنشطة الجمعية المختلفة تمنياتي ودعواتي للدكتورة نادية المبدعة ولجميع المتحدثين بالتوفيق وأشكركم جميعا على دعمكم للجمعية ومشاركتكم في هذه الأنشطة حفظ الله بلادنا وحكومتنا وبارك الله في الجميع تحياتي الله يعطيك العافيه دكتور منصور جود ايفنينج ايفري وان ذيس از مي دكتور عبد العزيز الدايل اون بيهالف اوف ذي سعودي بروسودونتيك سوسايتي اي ام جلاد تو هوست ذيس فيرتشوال ايفنت از وي اول نو ذات ذا وورلد كومفورتس ذا كوفيد 19 بانديميك ويتش ليد تو ا رابيد تشينجز ان لايفز Uh, to uh, help our government defeat uh, this challenge. Schools, shops, public and private sectors have all been suspended uh, uh, to uh, and force us to shift rapidly from in-person to online uh, learning, and uh, we did so. Uh, I'm glad to uh, first introduce our uh, first speaker, Dr. Nadia Al-Angiri, is a fellow of the American uh, College of Prosodontics Diplomate of the uh, American uh, Board for Prosthodontics and uh, a fellow of the Royal College uh, of Dentists of Canada since 2014. She earned her uh, prosthodontic clinical certificate 2014 and a Master of Science in Dentistry 2015 from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, United States of America. Currently, Dr. Langeri is the director of the joint programs of the Saudi Board uh, of Prosthodontics at the uh, Saudi Commission for Health uh, Specialities uh, and Program Director of the Saudi Board uh, of Prosthodontics uh, Residency Program at King Saud uh, Ben Abdelaziz University uh, for Health uh, Specialities. And uh, she is uh, a consultant in, of prosthodontics at King Abdelaziz Dental Center at uh, Ministry of National Guard uh, Health Affairs. Dr. Nadia, uh, No one can uh, talk, but I'm pretty sure that uh, everyone is glad to uh, hear from you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Ahlan wa sahlan bil jamia. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here today uh, to uh, present um, our first educational activity for the Prosthodontic uh, Education Week. Uh, the activity promoted by the Saudi Prosthodontic Society. Uh, it is a pleasure for me today also to have Dr. Ross, the uh, president of the American Prosthodontic Society, to attend my uh, lecture for today. Uh, pretty much the, today's uh, lecture will talk about um, the prosthodontic point of view when planning for aesthetic cases. Uh, we as a prosthodontist have a multidisciplinary treatment approaches. We have diversity of cases. We have uh, been faced with a lot of cases in the clinic that don't have a routine clinical scenario. So uh, looking at aesthetics from a prosthodontic point of view is pretty much challenging. So I think uh, being challenged by the concept of aesthetics uh, in a prosthodontic clinical setup will be today's uh, lecture. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Mansour Asiri for his introduction. Uh, Dr. Asiri is the uh, president of the Saudi Prosthodontic Society. Uh, his tremendous effort uh, in establishing this newly born uh, society uh, in uh, uh, September 2019. We're very privileged to have this specialized society in the uh, Gulf area as a unique uh, 
uh, specialized society uh, in the Gulf area and one of the few societies in the uh, Middle East. Uh, for us to be proud of you as attendees, we also like to have you as members in this society. Uh, kindly just log into www.prostodontics.org.sa and go to the register uh, icon. We have different types of membership. We encourage you all to enjoy and uh, uh, share our membership benefits. And uh, pretty much uh, uh, the uh, input of you, of, of you attending and having you as member in our society will pretty much promote the society for better education and uh, well-being. So let's talk about aesthetics. What, is, what, is, what exactly is aesthetics from a, a, a definition or a terminology point of view? Are we looking at, at, about a, a well uh, aligned teeth? Are we looking about a pearly smile? Are we looking about smile analysis? Are we looking at facial attractiveness? Uh, when we go through the literature, we cannot find a specific definition for aesthetics. What exactly is uh, an effort to try to define what aesthetics from a scientific point of view? Uh, rather than having uh, rigid rules and specific guidelines uh, and scientific methods, it's pretty much complicated to find a clear definition for aesthetics. And for us to understand aesthetics, we need to be more dynamic and more flexible. Uh, so we know that faces are asymmetrical, but faces are dynamic. So that's why the introduction of dynamic recording of facial uh, interaction helped in the analysis of uh, uh, smile aesthetics for our patient. Uh, so this led me to think about the aesthetic dentistry milestone in the past 100 years. So we know that in the past 100 years, a lot of innovations happened in uh, dentistry. And when we look through timeline, we see that the emphasis was more towards uh, aesthetic dentistry and digital dentistry. Uh, starting from our father of dentistry, Pierre Fouchard in the 18th century, we know that dentistry was at that time a separate specialty. So it's separated from medicine. So being a unique specialty in nature led uh, to a more uh, innovation, a more uh, improvement uh, when going through the 19th century. So going through the 19th century, the advocates of facial aesthetics, uh, talking more about the classic uh, prosthodontic literature, the guidelines that were advocated in those literature were pretty much uh, present at, uh, at the field. Uh, when we talk about the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, we're talking about the uh, emphasis of color and shade, the beginning of uh, speaking about uh, aesthetic dentistry, uh, going more towards uh, the second half of the 1900s, uh, the uh, concepts of denture aesthetics. And we know that the basis of uh, denture aesthetics led to the innovations in uh, aesthetics and fixed prosthodontics. So whatever guidelines that we have and what we're following in fixed prosthodontics, we're pretty much uh, coming from the basis of uh, uh, dentures and aesthetics of dentures. And we cannot forget the uh, emphasis of uh, Frosch and Fisher uh, when they talked about the spa concept and they talked about the guidelines that we need to think about when we're looking for our uh, guidelines when providing aesthetics for our denture. They talked about face, face shapes, they talked about the shape of teeth, how to coordinate geometries, and how to coordinate the sex of the patient with the personalities, with the attitude, how to gather all these parameters in your treatment planning. So looking how the development of aesthetic dentistry throughout the timeline could give us a hint about how we think about aesthetic dentistry. So I thought to talk about first the concepts, the innovation of concepts, and then go into the innovations of dental materials. So the area of the 1970s, the uh, introduction of the smile line, the smile arc, how does the teeth look like when the patient smiles? And then the innovation at that time was the introduction of golden proportion. So golden proportion was the only metric guide or the only metric parameter in aesthetic dentistry that we're using uh, pretty much solely. So we know that doing these measurements and guides and looking at percentages, central incisor, lateral incisor, and canines, all these parameters are pretty, mu pretty much solid, rigid parameters. And if we look at the recent uh, literature and the new evidence-based uh, treatment planning, golden proportion is not that evident. We're not looking at these rigid uh, uh, numbers. We're not looking for uh, so solid scientific methods that don't have any dynamic basis. So the trend is to be more uh, towards uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment planning in a dynamic way. So it is really important in my presentation. It's a pretty much easy presentation, but the uh, emphasis is on the thought of the process of treatment planning. So if we don't know how to plan our cases, then pretty much we are ensuring that the success rate of our treatments 
will drop tremendously. So the era of the 1980s and 1990s were more towards the uh, gingival components, the uh, corrective tissue grafts, the bone regeneration concepts, and so forth. And then the early millennium, they have talked about the uh, digital smile analysis. And uh, pushing through uh, the digital era is pretty much a huge transformation in our timeline. So uh, ta talking about how we could try to uh, uh, facilitate our aesthetic treatment modalities by incorporating the digital component. And starting from the 2014, Coachman advocated the digital smile design, or what we know as the DSD. So pretty much uh, using uh, different kinds of softwares, videos, uh, a lot of mobile applications have been introduced for this concept to record the patient in motion during dynamic uh, uh, movement and then trying to see how we could analyze our patient's aesthetics and formulate that into a definitive treatment plan. So uh, the previous concepts of having digital pictures and looking at pictures and only trying to do our solid measurements is not uh, accurate anymore, or it's not following the evidence-based dentistry anymore. So going through the uh, milestone of uh, dental materials, so let's look about these two going parallel together. So innovations and concepts, followed by innovations in uh, dental material concept. So as we have mentioned that the early concepts were about denture aesthetics, the classic literature of prosthodontics, and the uh, denture guidelines, then pretty much we're talking about acrylics. So polymethyl methacrylate was the innovative material at that time, fabricating dentures using acrylic material. The second half of the 1900s uh, talked pretty much about uh, uh, the adhesive dentistry, talked about uh, enamel acid itching, uh, talked about the dental bonding system, starting from the first generation, going through the second, third, fourth, fifth, up to the sixth and even the seventh generation, a three bottle system, two bottle system, a single bottle system, having everything in a single bottle. So all these innovative techniques in adhesive dentistry led to also uh, uh, advancements in uh, material properties in terms of ceramic, finding a good material that will bond adhesively uh, to these uh, innovatives and uh, uh, bonding systems will help to ensure the success of our restorations. So pretty much the adhesive dentistry was a breakthrough at that time. And uh, we know that Bonacore, Bowen, all those peoples were advocates for uh, enamel acid itching, using phosphoric acids, resin tags, and so forth. Uh, what happened pretty much was the uh, breakthrough uh, 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 through the 1965 when they advocated the porcelain fused to metal. So we know that the porcelain fused to metal was the golden standard at that time, we're uh, waiting to have a uh, 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 restorative material that has a metal substructure reinforced by metal substructure and covered by a tooth colored material. So at that time, having this kind of frustration was pretty much a huge transformation uh, in fixed prosthodontics. But when they have seen that the masking of metal substructure was pretty much difficult, they thought about a metal-free restoration. So they introduced the jacket crowns, trying to introduce alumina, trying to find uh, a material that could be strong enough to give good uh, physical properties. But on the other hand, they found that uh, improving the physical properties and strength of material will lead to decrease in aesthetics. So they were faced with dull restorations, loss of translucency. So again, more innovations, more thinking, more concepts uh, in that era. Uh, so uh, they introduced the uh, computer-aided design, the computer-assisted manufacturing uh, uh, devices. Uh, they talked about the concept of uh, uh, vital bleaching uh, porcelain veneers uh, using resin bonded fixed dental prosthesis to have aesthetic bridges in the anterior area and pretty much more innovation were towards to have laboratory CAD -CAM, uh, machines having more innovations in ceramics uh, more silica based ceramics more glass ceramics the introduction of lithium disilicate as a good ceramic with physical properties strength and more uh, uh, pleasing aesthetic uh, uh, outcomes the introduction of 3d printers and pretty much uh, the uh, 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 innovation of uh, founding a, a good ceramic material with high strength like zirconia in 2010. Uh, further studies were going on and then uh, introduction of uh, the polychromatic monolithic uh, zirconia, the translucent uh, zirconia in 2014 was a huge transformation to have a single block zirconia that is multichromatic that could be uh, milled uh, one time without having the layering component uh, trying to overcome 
and escape the problems that could arise from having two layers of materials bonded together. So talking about aesthetics will lead us to the other component of my presentation. Let's, so let's talk about prosthodontics. What is prosthodontics exactly? So being a prosthodontist pretty much gives me a privilege of dealing with different kinds of cases every day. We deal with different kinds of ages, from young age to geriatric patients to middle ages. Uh, we deal with diversity of cases. Uh, we deal with worn dentitions, full mouth rehabilitations, uh, uh, discoloration, uh, high gummy smile patients uh, requiring uh, rehabs, uh, patients with diastemas, patient mis patients missing single anterior tooth, patients with chronic periodontitis, missing uh, uh, teeth needs uh, restoration, patients with severe overbites, patients with malocclusion, so diversity of cases. So for us to plan our cases in an aesthetic uh, way, in a dynamic aesthetic way, uh, necessitate that we have a complete overview of our situation. So we're looking at occlusion, we're looking at function, we're looking at harmony with the oral cavity, muscles of mastication, the temporomandibular joint, and so forth. So we know that uh, uh, the uh, aesthetic dentistry is not a sole discipline. Uh, aesthetic dentistry is a special discipline that is incorporated in each and every clinical specialty in dentistry, starting from preventive dentistry, restorative operative dentistry, prosthodontics, orthodontics, periodontics, even oral and maxillofacial surgery. So each and every specialty have an aesthetic component in their specialty, and we need to address that aesthetic component, component from our point of view. So as we have mentioned, uh, to ensure a dynamic diagnosis and treatment planning for our patient, it is really important to understand our patient perception. So knowing that our male patients are more critique about quality and safety, and our female patients are more critique about aesthetic and quality, will definitely customize our treatment plan. Uh, it is important, as I have mentioned, that we don't uh, plan our patients all in the same category. So don't put all your patients in the same aesthetic framework. So make sure that your patients are customized for each treatment plan. What's happening now is that when we're talking about aesthetic dentistry, it equals veneers, and this is not the case. Veneers is not the only treatment modality or aesthetic modality that you could achieve for your patient. It is important that you understand each patient's perception, you understand each case uh, uh, a scenario of your patient, and then try to uh, uh, implement all your knowledge, your scientific background, uh, your negotiation with your patients, your communication, and it's really important to know your limitation. So this will add up to the success rate of your final uh, treatment outcome. Um, I have quoted some sentences from one of the articles by Bamish Moose 2018 that I felt it's really basic but really important. Uh, sometimes we miss the basic stuff and we overcome uh, the simple stuff and we go to the more complicated part. So not every cosmetic case should be treated with veneers and crowns, and this is true. We need to step the ladder one at a time. Start with the conservative treatment approach, then step the ladder one uh, step at a time. If you feel that you need to go for a more, more aggressive approach, then it could be the case. But starting with aggressive treatment modalities with your patient, just to achieve an aesthetic result that could be achievable with uh, a more conservative treatment approach, I call it is an iatrogenic dentistry. So we need to be more uh, compliant with our patient. We need to be more understanding of what options that we have. We need to be more conservative in our treatment uh, modalities. So conservative minimal intervention is more than sufficient in treating uh, some cases. Uh, it is the right of the patient to be informed and educated about all possible treatment options. So are we incorporating our patients in our treatment plans? Uh, when, I have went, when I was uh, preparing this presentation, I went through a lot of articles in the literature, and I was surprised with the tremendous amount of uh, literature talking about lay people perception. Uh, uh, lay people perception uh, that will affect the success of your treatment or the outcome of your treatment. Uh, so that gave me a hint that lay people are not lay people anymore. So basically, lay people now are more critique, they're more understanding, they more uh, uh, have a high sense of aesthetic in their uh, selection of cases, uh, which we all say that a patient don't understand dentistry, the patient don't understand the physical uh, compartment that we talk about, patients don't understand mechanics, true, but patients know how to look and patients know how to critique and patients know how to uh, look for his or her well-being, or their psychological well-being. So it is important for us uh, to incorporate lay people in our uh, treatment planning. 
But what's happening now is that most of dentists are, uh, are pushing towards their own beliefs, uh, their own perception about dental treatment. These perce perceptions were taught to us in dental schools, and we're trying to implement these perceptions to uh, lay people. We need to sit with our patients, communicate with our patients, understand what exactly is the aesthetic component in our patient's point of view. Maybe the aesthetic component in my point is the shape of a tooth. It could be the shade for the patient. It could be the gingival compartment. It, it could be the way that the patient is biting in a harmonious smile. So understanding your patient's perception about aesthetic will definitely guarantee your treatment outcome and your treatment success. So I have put some articles that were published and I thought they were beneficial to talk about. Uh, an article published in the American Journal of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics. Uh, it's a systematic review uh, by Perini et al. Uh, they talked about lay people's perceptions of frontal smile aesthetics a systematic review. So they talked about a lot of uh, uh, aesthetic parameters. Uh, they talked about the uh, central incisor uh, length to width ratio. They talked about different type of or shapes of central incisors that we have, uh, avoid, uh, tapered, square. They talked about diastema. They talked about uh, the uh, ratio of central to lateral incisors, the incisal edge, the horizontal level of anterior teeth. Uh, so a lot of parameters talked about in this article. The interesting thing is that they have uh, tested each of these parameters uh, by asking the patients to give their critique about pictures that they have seen. And the interesting part is that they're not using any more uh, digital photography. Uh, they're not using a separate uh, 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 digital photogra photography for patients. So uh, they're using a single parameter in each photography. They're using a uh, uh, digital photography editing software to change only one parameter at a time to avoid bias in uh, their studies. And then they asked the patient to evaluate the picture. And interestingly, as an example, patient could detect diastema up to one millimeter. So uh, knowing that your patient could detect as small as one millimeter diastema and tells you that this is not aesthetically appealing for me, give us more emphasis on incorporating our patients in our treatment plan. The other surprising thing for me was that we always say that if you, if you have a midline shift of four millimeters, then uh, lay people will discover that midline shift. And we, will, we were always giving this uh, example of Tom Cruise having a midline shift of four millimeter and people did not notice his midline shift. In the study, they have tested the midline shift by lay people perception and they have seen that lay people could perceive a midline shift up to two millimeter. The average was one point millimeter and the majority scored two millimeter for midline shift. So we could see that change, uh, changing in perception of our patients, the change in concept uh, necessitate that we incorporate our patients uh, in our dynamic treatment planning. Another systematic review in the Journal of Prosthodontic, uh, Prosthetic Dentistry, uh, uh, talking about lay preferences for dentogengival aesthetic parameters. Uh, in this article by Del Monte, uh, they were talking about almost the same parameters in Parini's study, but they incorporated more gingival parameters in terms of the gingival heights, the angulation, orientation, and so forth. And they reached up to more than 20 parameters or 20 aesthetic parameters that they have asked patients to judge. And interestingly, they have uh, uh, found the same conclusion that was found in the previous study. So lay people are not lay people anymore. We need to open up uh, our thoughts, uh, go out of the box and make sure that our patients are treat treatment planned according to their need, according to their perception. We know that the patient is the one who's gonna receive the restoration. The patient will be the one whose the psychological impact will be upon. We know that the patient's social interaction will be about his confidence, uh, his kindness, his popularity will be dealt with according to uh, the aesthetic treatment that was uh, perceived by uh, his or her dentist. So understanding our patients, uh, incorporating in our, our patients in our uh, treatment planning, uh, using an evidence-based diagnosis and treatment planning approach is really important. Uh, another study by Dr. Al-Qadi et al. in uh, King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences, they studied the relationship between patient participation in shade selection and their satisfaction of, of dental prosthesis. Uh, interestingly, they have found that 80% of their sample population were incorporated or participated in shade selection, which is perfect. Uh, for the other part of their sample, 
the ones that were not participated in shade selection and they did not choose uh, the shade of their prosthesis, they have seen that the patient was not satisfied in terms of uh, a shade selection. So either if the prosthesis was lighter or darker in shade, they were not happy with the final outcome. Uh, so uh, the uh, importance of incorporating our patients uh, or participating our patients in the treatment plan will guarantee the satisfaction of the final product and the success of our treatment plan. So let's now start with the conservative treatment approach that we have uh, in dentistry. And pretty much I'm gonna concentrate on the prosthodontic uh, treatment plans or treatment approaches that we do, starting from the conservative approach, going to the more complex approach. So knowing that bleaching is the conservative treatment approach, uh, applying uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, an oxidizing agent on the tooth surface uh, to remove the chromogenic agents uh, that discolor the tooth, uh, looking for uh, a lighter shade, one or two degrees, uh, uh, lightening up the shade for the patient, uh, knowing that vital bleaching is one of the uh, um, valid treatment modalities, uh, effective, cost-effective treatment modalities, efficient, and pretty much uh, conservative. Uh, we know that vital bleaching started with in-office bleaching with hydrogen peroxide and then with the uh, introduction of the vacuum uh, pressed uh, trays, uh, the uh, uh, home bleaching was advocated using carmamide peroxide with different concentrations. Uh, and then the uh, introduction in 2001 uh, for the uh, plastic strips or the whitening strips having a low dose of hydrogen peroxide uh, gained popularity. So having a patient with uh, good uh, teeth shape, good alignment, mild crowding, uh, good occlusion, uh, sound teeth. Why don't we start with bleaching as a conservative mean? So when the patient will see his or, his or her teeth in a more lighter shade, we'll give them a different perspective about their smile. And the majority of patients are happy with uh, uh, increasing the shade or lightening up the shade of their uh, teeth rather than going for a more uh, uh, aggressive treatment modality. So always start with basics. Uh, if a patient is not satisfied with the change in color, then pretty much uh, we could go uh, with other restorative uh, treatments. So uh, going to the next in line are the uh, non-prep veneers or prepless veneers or lumineers. Uh, these are very thin shell of a ceramic material that are bonded directly on the tooth structure with no preparation. So basically you only take impressions for your patient and then you fabricate the uh, restoration. Uh, for me, I'm not an advocate for lumineers. I don't like lumineers and I don't do them, but they're one of the treatment modalities that could be done and could be approached. Uh, specifically, if you have some kind of syndromes, some kind of spacing or small teeth, but you have to be very careful in selecting your patient. So try to avoid patients with prognathic maxilla, patients with problems in malocclusion, patients with skeletal uh, problems. So case selection is really important in these cases. Uh, I would rather do um, a minimally prepared veneer rather than doing a prepless veneer. But again, uh, uh, it is really important to understand that we have conservative treatment approaches and we need to go in sequence. So going to the third uh, treatment modalities, veneers, we know that the veneers is the golden standard. It's one of the efficient, one of the best treatment, uh, aesthetic treatment modalities given for our patient. Good aesthetic results, good success and survival rate. So pretty much it is one of the uh, uh, best treatment modalities for our patient if the patient is treatment planned uh, in a correct way. So talking about veneers, uh, I would like to uh, share with you uh, as a uh, program director and as a uh, director of the joint programs, I felt a privilege of having my uh, residents uh, uh, presenting their cases in my presentation. So I do thank them for giving me this chance, uh, giving me this privilege to present their cases and uh, supplementing my presentation. So uh, uh, you're going to see throughout the presentation uh, different case scenarios for my residents. Uh, and I hope that we could uh, uh, try to uh, open up the uh, thoughts about treatment planning and prosthodontics. So uh, again, going back to veneers, uh, when we talk about veneers, we know that uh, success rate is high. And the most important thing to understand is that patient does not understand that the 10 year mark is the cutoff for uh, the survival and success rate that was introduced in the literature. What they think is that after 10 years, they need to replace their uh, veneers. And this is not true. 
uh, with good uh, maintenance and recall appointments and doing a good prepared veneer, uh, good bonding uh, treatment for your patients, good knowledge and skills, you're going to ensure the productivity of your uh, veneer treatment. So we need to educate our patients. We need to tell them that the 10 year mark is not the cutoff time for you to replace your veneers. We only have to replace veneers if we have any problems, uh, any secondary caries, any fractures, any uh, failure modes that arise that needs replacement. Other than that, the literature talked about 10 year, 12 years and 15 years uh, success rate and survival rate of uh, uh, porcelain veneers. So early uh, in literature, they talked about the success of field spatic porcelain. And then uh, pretty much when you go through the literature, you're going to see high success rates uh, in glass ceramics and leave them disilicates. So with the introduction of uh, 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 good materials, uh, the improvement in material properties, uh, physical properties of the material, introduction of glass ceramics, the success rate uh, of these materials or the survival rate of these materials were pretty much high. So having uh, a good selection of material, a uh, good selection of cases is really important. So you as a restorative dentist, uh, treating your patients with this kind of uh, aesthetic treatment, you need to be knowledgeable about the advances in uh, dental materials, advances in technology, uh, be skillful in uh, performing your techniques, being patient, I do not believe about a one, two day treatment uh, uh, approach. I do believe that aesthetic treatment needs time and need good execu execution uh, to ensure that you have a, a successful uh, treatment outcome. So going to the failure mode of veneers, we, they, have saw, they have seen in the literature that uh, marginal defects when you have an existing composite restoration led to the most failure mode. So if you end your uh, preparation on composite restoration, you could expect to have failure sometime uh, throughout time. Uh, we always say that you need to have all your margin in enamel or you have to have uh, your enamel on your, your, sorry, your margins on a sound tooth structure. So uh, in case that you have a, a composite restoration uh, in your uh, preparation, try to overcome or bypass uh, your uh, restoration and uh, putting your margin on a sound tooth structure. Uh, problems exist from having uh, a composite restoration as your finish line could affect uh, your uh, impression sometimes, capturing details, uh, adhesive bonding. Uh, uh, you have to be very careful uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, preparing veneers uh, with a composite restoration. If you feel that you have a large composite restoration, then maybe veneer is not the treatment of choice. Maybe you need to change to a more uh, 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 harmonious restoration that will end up with a successful treatment. So maybe a crown or depending on the kind uh, of uh, restoration that you need. So the second in line was porcelain fracture after the uh, uh, marginal defects. And as I have mentioned previously, only 4% of the veneers needed to be replaced at the 10 year mark. So the uh, advertisement for our patients that you need to change your veneers after, after 10 years is not a correct uh, uh, plan. So we need to educate our patients that you need to uh, maintain your veneers, uh, maintain good oral hygiene, follow up your recall appointments, and uh, pretty much we could ensure the success of our treatment. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the dentist should be knowledgeable, skillful. Uh, you need to know your limitations. Don't push yourself out of the limit. If you feel that you're not capable of doing a specific case, you're always someone that is expert. So not only going for workshops, veneer workshops, uh, skillful workshops to improve your skills is the only thing that will determine the uh, successful outcome of your uh, treatment plan. So make sure that uh, you are knowledgeable enough, you're wise enough, you know your limitations, and you know when to treat and plan your patient. So let's start with one of the cases of one of our residents, Dr. Mohamed Al Amr. Uh, he planned a case for porcelain veneers. So we could see the picture before and after. So the patient was uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, discoloration. The patient had uh, uh, unevil tooth structure uh, shape. The patient was not happy about her smile. So the plan was to uh, uh, fabricate porcelain veneers for the patient. And we could see how when you execute the case in a skillful way, uh, when you uh, respect the aesthetic measures of your patient, you uh, uh, respect your patient's uh, 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 perception, you're going to end up with uh, a nice restoration. So uh, understanding material properties is really important. Understanding how to select your 
uh, uh, preparation design, how to understand your uh, smile parameters, really important for you uh, to execute uh, anesthetic restoration. Uh, another case by Dr. Mohamed Zahrani. Uh, this case was also treated by uh, porcelain veneers. Uh, so as we can see in the preoperative picture, the patient had uh, discoloration, uh, uneven shape of teeth, uh, unequal dimensions and wet of anterior teeth. And then the case was planned and uh, treated with porcelain veneers. And we could see how the smile tremendously changed. We could see that even the patient is smiling and confident. So this is the aim of our treatment. We want our patient to be confident, to have a good psychological well-being, uh, to be more uh, socially uh, interactive. And we don't want that part of our attractiveness be uh, um, uh, uh, dealt with in a negative way. So um, when you go back to the literature, uh, as we have mentioned that the uh, facial attractiveness is the most important thing people will capture when looking at a person. So the face is the most attractive part. Uh, looking deep into the face, we have two organs that are pretty much attractive, the eyes and the oral cavity. So knowing that the oral cavity is the second organ for uh, facial attractiveness, give us a huge emphasis on uh, having a good treatment planning and making sure that our aesthetic treatment plan is pretty much in a dynamic way. Uh, another case by Dr. Anis Ndijani. The interesting part about this case is that the patient received a faulty or iatrogenic veneers, previous porcelain veneers, and we could see that it is not a matter of prepping and cementing. We all could prep and cement. Uh, it is a matter of being uh, skillful, being knowledgeable, choosing the right uh, material, uh, being very critique in your uh, uh, treatment plan, and incorporating your patient in the uh, treatment outcome. So although that this patient did her veneers, uh, and uh, she was happy initially with the shade. With time, she was not satisfied with the outcome, plus that she had problems with the gingival component. So when we're working in aesthetics, we, know, we need not to neglect the gingival tissue uh, compartment. So we have the tissue aesthetics and we have the tooth aesthetics and they go together. So don't ever think that uh, aesthetic could be uh, separated from uh, healthy tissue. So uh, he changed the veneers uh, with more pleasing uh, shape, more pleasing shade, uh, translucency. We could see even that the embrasures are being filled with papilla and the smile is being more attractive. So this is what we want to do. We want to spend time on our patients. We want to spend time diagnosis our, diagnosing our patients. So this is the goal of our treatment. So going one step ahead more in the ladder, uh, fixed dental prosthesis. Could we achieve aesthetic results with fixed dental prosthesis? Uh, when we're talking about fixed dental prosthesis, we're talking about crowns, we're talking about bridges. Uh, so could we achieve that with uh, this kind of uh, uh, prosthesis? So the answer is yes, definitely. We could achieve good aesthetic results with FDPs. Uh, whether you're changing existing crowns or bridges or whether you're restoring heavily restored teeth, uh, these are one of the uh, valid treatment modalities that you could achieve uh, good aesthetic results. The, the key factor in uh, uh, aesthetics for your fixed dental prosthesis, especially when we're talking about bridges, is to select your pontic design. So uh, the literature have uh, shown that the majority of selection of uh, uh, pontics for the maxillary anterior area was the ridge lap design. And then it was followed by the modified ridge lap. So uh, basically it's really important that you communicate with your lab technician. So uh, communication with your lab technician, explaining to your lab technician what kind of design you want to go for, how you want to open your embrasures, how you want to design your pontic, uh, will help pretty much in a good fabrication uh, of your uh, uh, fixed dental prosthesis. More advanced in treatment, talking about implants. Implant is one of the most uh, uh, valid, re reliable uh, uh, treatment approach that has a good success rate, uh, especially when we're talking about a patient that is young, medically fit, has good bone and tissue support, sound teeth, and the patient needs to restore the missing area with a uh, dental implant. So in the anterior region, it is known that it is one of the difficult areas uh, to uh, achieve aesthetics, especially when we're talking about implants for different biology and mechanics. And uh, having a good uh, uh, treatment plan and uh, guiding uh, for your surgeon uh, to place the implant following specific criteria that you're going to set up for him or her uh, pretty much will execute a good uh, restoration. So uh, could we achieve good aesthetics with our implants? Yes, definitely we could. 
So understanding the limitation, understanding the case criteria, case selection, knowing which case will benefit from this kind of treatment modality, which case that could have some drawbacks will pretty much uh, add to the success rate of your uh, treatment. So talking about implants and tissue biology, it's really important to understand that the tissue compartment uh, in implant dentistry is not only for aesthetics, it also helps uh, to protect the underlying bone uh, from the ingress of microorganisms and products. So that's why we're saying all, always health and biology goes with aesthetics. You cannot have a bad foundation and then you uh, uh, pretty much draw a good uh, uh, picture on that foundation. You have to have a good uh, uh, disease-free uh, tissue and then you could fabricate your prosthesis on top of that. With that treatment, you're gonna guarantee the success of your treatment. What we're seeing for a very fast treatment approach is that they're doing uh, restorations or crowns or veneers and then apparently we're faced with a lot of problems in biology a lot of problems in mechanics so I'm not an advocate of a fast treatment uh, for the patient I always like to take time especially in the interior area uh, uh, the interior area needs time uh, uh, aesthetic dentistry is not forgiving aesthetic dentistry if you do it in a wrong way you cannot escape it's an irreversible treatment approach so basically you need to cut and break and redo everything from the beginning if we're talking about um, more complicated treatment approaches then pretty much we have problems because we could go for more complicated treatment approaches we could end up with extractions bone loss and more uh, 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 severe situations so a case by Dr. Mohamed Zahrani, a young patient that is completely dentulous. Uh, the patient was treated with full uh, mouth implants in the upper and lower jaws, and the patient was put on temporary. So what you're seeing now in the final picture is uh, a provisional restoration for the patient. So this is a provisional restoration. This is not the final one. Uh, the patient is in a healing stage, and uh, pretty much uh, uh, the patient will receive uh, the final prosthesis. So yes, we could achieve good aesthetic results with provisionals on implants. So it is a matter of good selection, it's a matter of good execution, it's a matter of good skills, good understanding. This is what we need when we're doing or dealing with uh, aesthetic cases. So going more higher in the ladder, can we combine treatment? Could we combine crowns with implants, with veneers? Yes, we could mix and match between different treatment modalities. Depends on the case. So a uh, case by Dr. Anas Abu uh, we could see that the previous uh, picture uh, shows the patient with faulty restorations, previous crowns, missing tooth, and the patient is not happy with her smile. You could see different colors, different stains, and the, the case was analyzed, uh, the case was treated, and the final outcome was a mixture of crowns, veneers, and bridges. So the patient received a good aesthetic restoration. So why don't we approach these kind of treatments uh, in this kind of way? Why are we always in a hurry to uh, execute aesthetic cases in a very fast way uh, just to finish the case and wrap up the case? Aesthetic cases are very nice. They're very pleasing. Uh, uh, they, they give you good satisfaction, but if you don't do them in a the right way, it's gonna end up in the opposite direction. So a uh, uh, third case by Dr. Lhanouf al uh, this case was dealt with uh, a single implant in the area of tooth number 11 or tooth number eight. Uh, we could see that uh, restoring uh, a single uh, missing tooth in the anterior area is one of the difficult approaches in aesthetic dentistry. So matching the shape, matching the shape, the dimensions, the tissue architecture is really difficult. So she managed the case with a single implant in the area of tooth number 11 and uh, restoring the other uh, adjacent teeth with uh, porcelain veneers. So having a good soft tissue architecture, having good gingival margins, good gingival levels, uh, shade selection, it's really important. So uh, working with your cases will give you a very good aesthetic outcome. You just need to spend time on your cases, you need to understand your cases, and pretty much the most important part is to understand your patient's perception. Uh, a case uh, from our host, Dr. Abdelaziz al uh, The case is treated with a combination of uh, crowns, uh, veneers, uh, implants, uh, bridges. Uh, so uh, a quick uh, um, look at his case. So case was treated with crowns, single implant on the upper right quadrant, and then two implants on the other uh, left quadrant. And so this is a full mouth rehabilitation case. And this is the case before and after. So. 
uh, executing your case in a very nice way uh, gives you satisfaction and gives the patient a high success uh, treatment. So uh, whatever is built up with aesthetics, it's built with psychology. So we're looking for patient psychology. Uh, this will affect your patient psychology. It will affect the patient's well-being. It will affect, affect your perception. If we're talking about the prosthodontic point of view, we're talking about intraoral harmony. We're talking about muscle harmony, joint harmony, occlusion harmony, function harmony, aesthetic harmony, all build up together in one compartment. So this is the key. This is the most difficult and challenging part in our specialty. Uh, another case by Dr. Wajil Gattan, uh, if you can see that this case uh, has a deep overbite, uh, problems in occlusion, uh, faulty restoration, implant, uh, faulty implant FDP, uh, problems in staining and uh, a lot of uh, issues going on. The case was dealt as a rehabilitation. The uh, vertical space was corrected. Uh, the crowns were uh, redone. And uh, pretty much this is the case before and after. Uh, so uh, again, working on your cases will give you uh, good aesthetic outcomes, good uh, tissue outcome. Uh, and this is the patient, the same patient in smile. Can you imagine that the previous patient, the one with the deep bite, could have a smile like this, uh, a pleasing smile, a natural smile, a harmonious smile. Just to let you know, not, not every case could be dealt restoratively and not every case that you could just crown and bridge and correct problems in malocclusion or skeletal problems. But sometimes with good management and good planning, you could uh, treat some cases with uh, your restorative options. So a uh, uh, case by Dr. Ahmed al Harbi, the patient has a uh, uh, worn dentition, uh, uh, reverse uh, overbite, uh, poor oral hygiene, gingival inflammation. When the patient smiles, uh, the patient does not show uh, only two teeth from uh, his smile. So it gives the patient a more elderly appearance. And uh, treating the patient with a full mouth rehabilitation, uh, uh, performing good aesthetic dentistry for the patient. So aesthetic dentistry is not always having pearly white teeth. So having good stains, uh, good characterization, following the patient's uh, perception, the patient's uh, 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 choice of having a shade, a uh, specific shade uh, for him or her is really important. So uh, executing the case with a nice uh, restoration, healthy restoration, uh, and a nice smile pretty much change the patient's psychology, the patient's smile, even the patient's age. A uh, case by Dr. Ahmed Al Malki was also treated by a uh, combination treatment of, uh, so all the cases that I'm presenting now is a mixture of crowns, implant, bridges, veneers, and so forth. Uh, so uh, we could see now that this case also had problems uh, in occlusion, problems in restorations, uh, uh, tissue health, discoloration, and so forth. And the case was dealt with a uh, combined treatment of crowns, uh, uh, veneers, uh, and so forth. And we could see how you could achieve good aesthetic harmony uh, in your cases. So a uh, healthy tissue, uh, natural shade, uh, good occlusion, uh, uh, harmony with muscles of mastication. These are the goals of our prosthodontic treatment. So this is the case before and after, and we could see the difference uh, between the two. And going more to comprehensive treatment when we're dealing with multidisciplinary cases. So you need to involve another members in your team to help you in your cases, to prepare your cases uh, pre-prosthetically. Uh, some cases you need to stop. You need to know that these cases need to be referred either for orthodontist or for periodontist to prepare the case for you before you start. So make sure that uh, uh, you know the cases that needs to be referred. Uh, so one of the cases by Dr. Yusuf Azzat, the case has a dummy smile. Uh, faulty restoration, discoloration, uh, malocclusion, uh, uh, skeletal problems. The case was dealt with orthodontic treatment, and then it was followed by the prosthetic treatment. So if you're going to execute this case without doing the ortho treatment, I'm sure you're going to end up with an iatrogenic dentistry with faulty restorations and ugly restoration. So knowing when to refer cases, when to select cases to be done restoratively, and when to do cases prosthodontically. Uh, perio is another part, so uh, preparing your cases for aesthetic crown lengthening, doing your diagnostic wax up, your surgical stent, uh, doing your templates, defining your margins, preparing your crowns, especially in cases when you have uh, erosion and, uh, and uh, wear, uh, uh, short clinical crowns, uh, you're going to redefine your aesthetic crown matrix again, you're going to do your surgery, your templates, your margins, and then you're going to deliver your restoration. So 
this is when we, this is really important to understand that you have multidisciplinary cases that you need to share with other specialties. And it is important that you incorporate other teams uh, or other members in your team to help you in preparing your cases. Uh, finishing from the tooth structure component, we're talking about the pink component. We're talking about the gingival aesthetics. We're talking about the pink component. Do we need to pink or not to pink? Sometimes we are in situations that we face that a uh, surgical component uh, could not help in achieving or build up the lost tissue or soft tissue structure, the bone or soft tissue structure. And we're faced with situations that we need to um, uh, try to manage our cases prosthetically. So a case that, that we see here uh, that has a, a gummy smile, faulty restoration, uh, teeth number uh, one, two and one, one have a, uh, a faulty restorations, chronic periodontitis, poor oral hygiene, uh, we could see different shapes of teeth, different uh, margins of uh, gingival, gingival heights. So pretty much it's a very challenging case. The case was, was dealt with extracting of tooth number one, two, and one, one, and fabricating uh, implant prosthesis with pink porcelain. So uh, this is the final outcome for the patient. Although that the patient has a high smile line and a gummy smile, selecting the correct shade for the pink porcelain led to a more pleasing uh, restoration, although we did not correct the gummy smile component. So this will lead me to the next slide, which talks about the gingival shades. So we know that gingival shades are there in the market. You could have gingival shades for your composites. You could have gingival shades for your acrylic. And you can, you can have gingival shades for your uh, porcelain. So depending on your prosthesis or your restoration, you could select the material that suits you better. And you have different shade guides that could help you in selecting the proper treatment uh, or proper shade selection for your case. Uh, so um, uh, going through these, uh, it's really important to not build up teeth that are very long or very whitish in color. Uh, you need to break up the tooth component into a soft tissue component, a pink component, and a white uh, uh, tooth component. So another case by Dr. Abdelaziz Abdayil, uh, it's a full mouth comprehensive case, uh, dealt with crowns, veneers, and so forth, and implants. And also the case was dealt with pink porcelain. And we could see the pink porcelain component in the upper left quadrant for the patient. Restorations in harmony, tissue harmony, and stable occlusion. This is the goal for our treatment. So talking about acrylics and gingival shades, uh, we know that uh, uh, acrylics are pretty much related to dentures. And uh, selecting the shades for your dentures could add up to your aesthetic component. So does complete dentures or removable prosthodontic could add up to the aesthetic component? Could we achieve aesthetic uh, treatment modalities uh, for our patients? Uh, could we achieve it with a removable option? So this is the gold standard for us as a prosthodontist. We are dealing with removable cases. We're the specialty that likes to work with removable prosthodontics, whereas other specialties pretty much hate us for that. And going with removable prosthodontics and being able to achieve good aesthetic results with these kind of restorations is pretty much promising. So knowing that the companies are advocating for new denture teeth uh, that are more aesthetic, more natural in appearance, uh, and uh, festooning and preparing your acrylic component in a very natural way that could add up to the aesthetic part is pretty much challenging. And looking as a part of complete dentures, being aesthetic is not only having white aligned pearly teeth. We could have aesthetics in the patient's perspective by having his original situation. Some patients will tell you that I don't want to have a straight aligned teeth. I don't want people to know that I'm having dentures inside my mouth. So doing some kind of characterization, staining, a uh, kind of malalignment, small diastomas, a little prognathism, following the guidelines of complete denture setup will help us to achieve aesthetic results. So is removable partial denture, again, another option for uh, aesthetic uh, treatment modalities? Yes, yes, yes. Removable prosthodontics could achieve good aesthetic results uh, for our cases. So a case from Dr. Anas and Dijani, a completely dentureless patient treated with uh, upper and lower conventional complete dentures, uh, selecting the appropriate uh, teeth size and mold uh, shade, uh, doing good characterization of the acrylic when doing festooning and building up the contours is really important. Spending time by evaluating your patient's lip support, uh, uh, um, 
uh, mesolabial angle, the uh, vertical dimension, making sure that your aesthetic component is going in harmony with the facial geometry of your patient. So this is the, this is the case inside the patient's mouth. We could see how the restoration is in harmony. The restoration is natural, no fake appearance. No one will know that the patient has dentures inside her or his mouth. Another case by Dr. Anas, uh, it's a combination of an upper complete denture and the lower partial denture. As we can see from the preoperative picture, the patient is a dentulous in the upper arch. Uh, the patient has badly broken teeth in the lower arch. The case was treated with an upper conventional denture, lower surveyed crowns, and a uh, removable partial denture. When the patient is smiling, we cannot say whether the patient had a full mouth rehabilitation or the patient receives removable prosthesis. So this is the goal of our treatment. Aesthetic does not rely only on a sole material. You are very selective in your material. You could choose whatever material that will give you the exact, exact aesthetic result that you want. So you're the master, you're the one who has the knowledge, you're the one who understands the physical properties. So looking at immediate dentures, we're always fear, fearful of immediate dentures uh, to give good aesthetics. And could we achieve good aesthetics with immediate complete dentures? This is how Dr. Anas showed his case. So a case that he have presented, the patient was planned for immediate conventional complete dentures. Patient extracted all upper and lower teeth and received an immediate denture. So yes, immediate denture could give us aesthetic results, could implement our aesthetic outcome. Although that it is a temporary treatment modality or an interim treatment modality for our patient, yet it will serve the aesthetic purpose for our patient and it will serve the functional component. Uh, another case by Dr. Lhanouf, uh, also a combination of a complete denture in the upper arch uh, and a classical uh, conventional RPD in the lower arch, although that the patient has or the uh, prosthesis has uh, clasps on the lower uh, teeth, but when the patient smiles, that does not show. So this is the art of dentistry. This is the art of prosthodontics, that you could uh, modify your treatment approach to be aesthetic in each and every parameter. You're the one who's going to guide the treatment. You're, gonna one who, you're the one who's going to communicate with your technician. You're the one who's going to communicate with your patient. You're going to understand your patient. You're going to look at perception of your patient to uh, uh, get a pre pretty much um, uh, uh, successful uh, treatment outcome. So to uh, conclude my presentation and the take home message from this presentation, uh, aesthetic dentistry is not a sole discipline. It is everywhere in each and every clinical specialty. Just look, look at aesthetic dentistry in your specialty. Uh, it's really important to uh, incorporate your people or your patient uh, in your uh, treatment plan. Lay people are not lay people anymore. Uh, incorporating them and participating them in your treatment plan will ensure a high success rate of your treatment outcome. Uh, the most important thing to understand is that we need to formulate our uh, diagnosis and treatment plan according to evidence-based dentistry and dynamics. There is no more solid, uh, uh, rigid numbers and guidelines and scientific methods that are solely to aesthetic dentistry. Everything is there. Everything is dy dynamic. The introduction of aesthetic dentistry. Uh, in future, we're going to have the artificial intelligence and the printers. So we need to be open for everything and ev everything uh, uh, in terms of concepts and technologies. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, uh, I thank you all for attending my presentation. I would thank again the Saudi Prosthodontic Society uh, for this opportunity to um, uh, present this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm pretty much happy to answer you in the question and answer part. Uh, if you'd like to contact me directly, uh, kindly contact me on my email. Uh, I won't mind to uh, reply back to you. Um, also, uh, be uh, prepared for a question at the end of the presentation. Uh, there's going to be a question uh, at the end of the presentation. You just need to go to our accounts and social media, answer that question, and you could be one of the winners of a free membership in the Saudi Prosthodontic Society. So I'm just going to go through the um, uh, questions and answers. So one question was, what are your thoughts on bleaching the teeth prior to placing porcelain veneer? Would you replace uh, the stump shade by a problem on the long run? Would you have a relapse on the stump shade 
by a problem on the long run. It's really important to diagnose the kind of stain that you have. Do you have an intrinsic stain or do you have an extrinsic stain? And if you're looking at each one of those, you need to follow specific measures. So if you're looking at uh, extrinsic stains, then there is no pretty much uh, effort of doing veneers at the beginning. You could do bleaching first, look at how much shade that you're gonna get from bleaching and then go uh, and evaluate. Then if you see that the patient is not satisfied, you could go for um, uh, another treatment or restorative treatment as veneers. If you're talking about uh, intrinsic stains, then this is another story. Intr intrinsic stain actually needs a whole lecture to talk about. Uh, you need to be very careful. Some sometimes uh, bleaching the stump will help. Uh, putting in mind what is the reason for stain? Is it fluorosis? Is it uh, a previous root canal treatment? What exactly is the reason if you're intrinsic stain? According to the reason, you're gonna uh, approach that whether with non-vital ble non -vital bleaching or if you need to um, uh, only mask it with opaquers, whether it's in your cement or in your layering of your uh, veneer uh, material. Um, are you against lumineers? Um, to be honest, I am not a fan of lumineers. There could be good support in the literature for lumineers. Uh, there are a lot of advocates for lumineers, but personally, I don't do them. I'm not convinced to do lumineers, to be honest. Uh, just sticking uh, um, a ceramic material on top of a, tooth, a sound tooth structure uh, have a lot of uh, concepts in terms of biology. Uh, what we're facing with lumineers actually is the over-contouring. So if you could ensure that you're not gonna have problems in over-contouring, you're not gonna have problems in bonding, then pretty much it could be one of the uh, valid treatment modalities. Um, another question is, how can I decide which Pontic is better? Um, okay, to decide Pontics, pretty much you need to evaluate your soft tissue. You need to evaluate your ridge. Uh, sometimes you need to prepare the ridge area before you do even your bridge. So let's say that you have uh, a three unit that you're gonna prepare and the missing tooth has a defect. Uh, if the defect is pretty much uh, pronounced, then it's better to go and consult your periodontist to be able to augment the ridge in that area to give you a fuller uh, appearance of the tissue to avoid uh, biological problems in terms of uh, uh, food impaction and pretty much aesthetic problems. So looking at the architecture of your soft tissue will help you to determine which kind of pontic that you're gonna decide for your final prosthesis. How can we decide whether the case is a deep bite could be treated with restorative crowns? Okay, uh, the golden standard for us in aesthetic dentistry and in prosthodontic per se, we always love diagnostic wax up. Diagnostic wax up is our heart. It's the heart of prosthodontics. So uh, evaluating your case, doing your diagnostic measure. That's why I'm always saying that you need to do your diagnosis in a dynamic way. So uh, make sure that uh, when you uh, plan your case, you take your time in the diagnostic part. The prosthodontic part is really easy. You're gonna prep, you're gonna take impression, you're gonna deliver, it's very easy. But the diagnosis part is the tricky part. So making sure that you're gonna plan your case uh, very well, take your records, do your diagnostic wax up, uh, pretty much in cases that you're doing uh, a complete rehabs or when you have like a deep overbite or skeletal problems, I encourage you to uh, take a lateral cephalometric for your patient, sit with your orthodontist, discuss the case, and then see what exactly you could offer your patient. And pretty much using mockups also will help you in defining the final outcome. Um, There is a question to prep first or crown lengthening. Uh, depends on the case. Usually what we do, we do an initial preparation, okay? And then uh, when we do our wax up, in our wax up, we determine the increase in height in our gingival compartment. And we, do, uh, we duplicate that, we do a suck down, and then we provide this guide to our periodontist to know exactly how much increase that they need to do. After doing the crown lengthening, we're gonna modify our margin. We're gonna drop our margins and then fabricate our provisional restoration. Doctor, um, yes. Uh, sorry to uh, interrupt you. I'll, uh, just I saw I'll bring uh, everybody to see it. You can just type uh, one letter to type answer. عشان يطلع لهم في Q&A. Because I'm filtering the questions, I prefer to read them. Uh, 
uh, because a lot of them are just giving compliments about the uh, presentation. So uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, prefer yeah. just to read. Any question you want to uh, to expose it to everyone, just type uh, type answer. Okay, just perfect. To be, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, um, can we get a PDF for this uh, class? Uh, basically, if you are um, a member of the Saudi Prosodontic Society, this presentation is recorded and you could find it later on uh, in our digital library. Uh, if you need a PDF of this presentation, kindly just uh, email me on my email and I would be happy to assist you. Um, Thank you everyone for attending. I'm seeing a lot of compliments. I do appreciate that. Uh, can we see the lecture recorded after finishing? Yes, uh, we encourage you all to be members in our uh, society. We're gonna have a huge library, digital library for some of our presentations. And we're gonna, and this, as I have mentioned, this presentation is recorded. So uh, a, a copy of this presentation will be available hopefully. Um, Regarding the midline shift, can we do veneers if yes, what is our limit? Okay, uh, midline shift is, uh, uh, depends on your evaluation and your diagnosis. So when we're evaluating midline shift, we're not looking at midline shift between upper and lower teeth. We're looking at midline shift towards the whole face. So we're looking about the face, the facial midline going with the anterior uh, midline of your teeth. So evaluate the midline, uh, look at the patient's face, uh, sometimes patients have uh, deformities in their nose. They have shifted their all of the nose. Uh, so make sure that you evaluate the midline shift. How much is the midline shift? Do your diagnostic locks up, explain to the patient and see. Sometimes small midline shifts could be corrected. Sometimes small midline shifts could be kept. And sometimes we need to go for orthodontic treatment to correct some uh, extreme midline shifts that could affect your treatment uh, outcome. So I don't prefer that you just uh, do veneers in uh, cases with exaggerated midline shift. Uh, some patients have nice shade and still want more and more whiter. How do we deal with this kind of patients? Uh, this is the uh, importance of talking to your patient and communicating with your patient and understanding your patient's need, the perception of your patient. Uh, unfortunately, because the trend is having uh, very white uh, uh, new teeth is very popular this time and everyone is looking for a very white uh, um, fluorescent teeth. Uh, so when you explain to your patient uh, the aesthetic parameters, you explain the skin tone, the eye color, the, the color of the hair, uh, you show the patient different pictures, you negotiate with your patient, you explain to your patient how much is that we could go lighter for your case, patient will understand. The patients just need someone to be more patient with them more explaining to them. What we're seeing in aesthetic dentistry that most of the dentists are only uh, advertising for treatment and not explaining the outcomes. So it is important to uh, explain the outcomes. It is important to uh, educate our patient. It is important that the patient feels secure with you as an aesthetic dentist. So when the patient understand that, understand that you're confident, you know what you're doing, you have scientific background, the patient will trust you. Uh, how to overcome post-operative veneer sensitivity. Uh, this is a pretty much, uh, um, this is a huge topic, but when we're talking about post-operative sensitivity, what are we uh, exactly talking about? Are we talking about, um, uh, do you have any kind of open margins? Uh, do you uh, have any problems in preparation? Are you have, do you have, uh, uh, did you over prep your veneer? Uh, is the uh, dentinal tubules pretty much exposed? Uh, where they're sensitive by the uh, uh, acid and bonding and adhesive stuff. So we need to understand exactly what's going on. You need to evaluate. Some sensitivity will resolve with time and some will necessitate root canal treatment. So it's really important to address which kind of sensitivity we're talking about. Um, what's your thought on doing prepless diastema closure with resin composite? No prep, no roughening, only composite closure. I think doing uh, a diastema closure, small diastema closures uh, with composite restoration is a valid treatment modality. The only thing that I will do, I will bevel uh, the area so I will not distinguish the cutoff between the restorative part and the tooth structure part. And you need to inform your patient that with time you could end up with 
uh, some kind of discoloration. So the patient will understand in case discoloration happens, because we know that we, we cannot control the patient's uh, intake of beverage, food, smoking, and so forth. So uh, composite restoration is a valid treatment modality uh, for closing diastema. Uh, for the people that are answering uh, the uh, question uh, in uh, Zoom, kindly answer in our accounts in the social media so it could be counted in the draw. Uh, bleaching concentrations are a worry or not. Uh, when we're talking about uh, in-office bleaching, it is guarded by the dentist. So the dentist is the one who's going to control uh, the concentration and time. So he knows the concentration. He's the one who's going to select the concentration. And he or she are going to connect, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, select the time. Uh, when we're talking about home bleaching, the dentist will prescribe for you the exact concentration that you need, depending on your case, provided that there are no caries lesions, there are no problems, uh, that needs to be dealt with prior to uh, uh, doing the bleaching um, treatment. Usually the home bleaching is a low concentration. Uh, some companies have used a higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide home uh, bleaching strips, but for half an hour time. If you know that your patient have problems in compliance, always use a low concentration, 10% or 15%. That will be low, but will be durable. You could do it for a long a week or two weeks and it will be durable for your a uh, patient with uh, good outcomes. Can veneers help in adjusting anterior guidance? Uh, this is a very uh, uh, sensitive topic uh, when we're talking about veneers to adjust the anterior guidance. If you are looking at uh, uh, veneers to correct your anterior guidance, you have to be very careful about your material thickness and where exactly is your contact and protrusive. So make sure about that in your um, uh, uh, diagnostic wax up. Uh, pretty much we try to avoid having uh, a specific kind of preparation, let's say window preparation. Let's say we, uh, when we're doing the overlap, we have to do an overlap in a specific uh, uh, measurements to overcome the escape and protrusive record. Uh, what's your opinion about partial veneer? Um, I have not do it. I didn't do partial veneers. But I think partial veneers is a, another synonym of indirect composite restorations. So they're valid. They could be done. Why not? Uh, they're more conservative than prepping, especially if you need to close a diastema without preparing the whole tooth structure. The patient is happy about the shade. The patient is happy about the shape. We just need to close the diastema. So I think it is a valid treatment modality. Um, how long do you typically wait after bleaching to start bonding, preparing a tooth? In other words, how does bleaching affect your bond strength? Um, uh, this is a, a topic that has been discussed heavily in literature. And uh, pretty much if we're talking about bleaching, you should not start your treatment as a cutoff time, uh, let's say two weeks before you start your uh, uh, treatment for uh, aesthetic, uh, uh, any aesthetic modality. Uh, will bleaching affect your bond strength? It will not aff affect your bond strength if you're not doing it at the same time or if you're not doing it immediately a day after or 24 hours after. Uh, bleaching is only a matter of an oxidizing agent that is breaking up the chromogenic agents or uh, stains on the tooth structure. Uh, so basically, uh, we always encourage patients after bleaching to use a fluoridated toothpaste to uh, close the tubules or the pores in the tooth structure that could cause sensitivity. So pretty much I don't think that we could have a problem uh, when using bleaching if we wait for the proper time before we're doing uh, the final treatment outcome. Um, how long the follow-up for veneers and what do you uh, do in the follow-up visit? Um, basically, I would like to follow up my patient one week after to make sure that there is no remnant cements. Uh, to make sure that the tissue healed perfectly. Sometimes during um, a cementing uh, uh, veneers, you could end up with some kind of bleeding, or when you do finishing, you end up with some kind of bleeding. So seeing the patient one week after, the tissue will heal. You could see if there's any remnant cement, if you need to do any kind of finishing. And then after that, you could schedule uh, a three months follow-up for your patient, depending on the case and depending on the compliance of your patient. And then I will see the patient one more last time for a year. And then after that, uh, I'll just tell the patient, if you have any problems, you can just call me and come in for a visit. Um, 
I'm sure this is out of the aesthetic part, but when you are restoring two implants in one one and two one, would you splint them or make them separate? Usually I will separate them. I will not splint them unless I have a specific biological consideration or a mechanical consideration that necessitates splinting the two teeth together. Um, what do you think about an ovate pontic sort of inside the socket of a freshly extracted tooth? Um, the ovate pontic is good at the beginning. It will give you good aesthetic results. But the, the question is, what are you going to do after that? What is your uh, final treatment uh, approach? Are you using the ovate pontic only to mold your tissue and then fabricate your final prosthesis? Uh, so sometimes it is beneficial, especially in patients with thick gingival biotype. You want to mold the tissue uh, uh, in a way that presses the tissue to give you a good contour. But again, you have to be very selective in choosing which patients that you're going to choose uh, this treatment modality. Uh, what if the patient insists on the wrong treatment? Um, if you're asking for my advice, if you do the right way in presenting the case, showing the patient uh, the records and explaining the treatment modalities, the drawbacks, uh, the failure that could arise, the, uh, um, uh, the success of the treatment, the patient will understand. Let's say that we have patients that don't understand and they're pretty much uh, restricted on a specific treatment modality. I would, and I have done that, I just apologize from the patient that I cannot perform this kind of treatment modality because it's against my ethics, it's against uh, what I have been uh, 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 trained on or what I'm knowledgeable about, and they could find other people that could do uh, this kind of uh, treatment. It's really important to build up your reputation. It's really important uh, to be uh, scientific, to be evidence-based in your treatment. Uh, it's really important to know your limitation. So this will give trust in your patient uh, in your treatment uh, planning. What about uh, the role of attachments in RPD aesthetic? Yes, aesthetics uh, could be achieved by attachments in RPD. I did not add, up, I add this in my presentation, but yes, you could use different kinds of attachments, whether these attachments are on implants, locators, or ERA attachments, or any kind of intracoronal or extracoronal attachments could be used for um, uh, aesthetic results. Um, What about those who are saying smile design is a lie? I don't have that much cases, but I, it helps me to guide me where the area that needs gingivectomy or no. No, we did not say that the smile design is, is a lie. We're saying that smile analysis and smile design is a dynamic process. And the new concepts of the DSD is basically by recording your patient and looking at dynamic pictures and then analyzing your patient. The only thing that have been mentioned in the literature is that golden proportion is not gaining more popularity nowadays with the DSD concept and the dynamic concept uh, because it's a solid metric rule and uh, pretty much based on uh, scientific methods and guidelines. So looking at the teeth in specific dimension, looking at specific percentages is not dynamic anymore. So we need to be more flexible on that. Can you talk about diastema preparation and when I decide closing the diastema using crowns? Uh, if you're going to reach up to close your diastema with crown, I think it is better for you to consult your orthodontist first. Uh, usually, I like to close small diastema with restorative means, whether with um, uh, composites or, as they mentioned, the partial veneers or veneers. Uh, but if you're going to go with crowns to just only close, the purpose for, for the crown is only to close the diastema, I will not go with that approach. I will definitely consult my orthodontist. Um, how about using dowel concept and direct composite in case of localized interior tooth wear instead of doing conventional crowns and surgical crown lengthening? Uh, it depends what kind of tooth wear that we're talking about. Uh, the cases that I have presented in my presentation, these are full mouth rehabilitation cases. The patients suffer from problems in phonetics. The patients suffer from problems in function. So we have to rebuild everything inside the patient's mouth. Minor wear inside the patient's mouth could be dealt with either direct composite, indirect composites, sometimes on lays, depending on the case. Um, when I have crown and veneers, how can we match the colors? Uh, it is really important when you're planning for veneers and crowns to take one impression for both. 
don't take separate impression for veneers and another impression for crowns to make sure that the technician will build up the crowns and the shade as much as possible together. The trick is not in matching the crowns and the veneers. The technician could help you in matching the shade of the uh, crown and veneers if you select the appropriate the material. material. The, uh, the idea is capturing the shade. So the problem is that you're capturing the shade in your uh, clinic, in the, the light of your clinic, and then the technician is building up the restoration in a different light. So the changes in light is the problem. So uh, a new uh, uh, attempt is to develop, uh, or at least we could see them now in the uh, market, specific light that you could use in your clinic, you could give it to your technician, and uh, you could transport uh, or transfer the shade selection. The problem with shade is how can you transfer the shade from your clinic to your technician? This is, this is the idea. So if you could, could uh, ensure uh, the light in your area to be the same, or sometimes you could call your technician with you in the clinic to help you uh, in selecting the exact shade and drawing the color uh, map will be beneficial. Sometimes you take pictures and sometimes you take videos, but putting in mind that you have a light from your camera, you have flash from your camera, you have the setup area that you're taking the uh, uh, photos from, will definitely change the shade of your uh, uh, case. For attrition, can we raise the bite by only? Only depends on the case. Depends on the case and the WhatsApp. Uh, what bonding problems we may face when doing lumineers? Uh, sometimes you could be faced with uh, debonding problems or debonding issues, especially in areas that the uh, uh, itching did not reach or the adhesive component did not reach. Uh, sometimes uh, forces on the uh, anterior teeth could break up. Uh, um, the bond, and you could uh, have uh, a debonded um, restoration. What is the cause of dark shade in the gingiva, uh, top of the porcelain veneer? Uh, it depends. Uh, what is the cause? Uh, sometimes you could have um, problems in either uh, bleeding. Sometimes if you have problems in bleeding and you use a hemostatic agent, it will stain the area, but it will go. Uh, sometimes if you have a previous uh, restoration in that area, the breakdown of the material could uh, show uh, stains underneath the gingiva. If the patient has a thin gingival biotype, then pretty much you're expecting to have uh, uh, um, uh, a clear uh, a shade showing through, through that uh, tissue. It is really important to understand whether your case is a thin a gingival biotype or a thick gingival biotype. Uh, if the patient has dark stain as a physiological pigmentation, this is a different story. But usually, uh, if you prepare your veneer in a very uh, delicate way, you're not supposed to have any problems in the gingiva or any shades arising in the gingiva from traumatic preparation. Um, other than that, sometimes some materials have metal components that could break down but I'm not aware of any um, dark stains on top of or on the uh, gingival area of veneers, unless you have problems with bleeding. What is your favorite technique to take bite registration in full rehab cases? Um, this is a very, uh, um, it's a very long topic, but we have different ways to take uh, bite registration, the most important thing is that you have support. You have a vertical stop when you're recording each part inside uh, the patient's mouth. Um, I don't like the propolis veneers too, but some doctors said that we can do the propolis veneers, but at least with the finish line. What do you think? If you're going to do a propolis veneer with a finish line, it is not a propolis veneer anymore. Uh, the time between crown lengthening and final crown. This is really important when we're talking about aesthetic cases. Uh, it depends on the case. It, depending, it depends on whether you removed soft tissue or bone or both. Uh, it depends on how you uh, uh, evaluated the case. Uh, usually what I do, I communicate with my periodontist and, I, and, and we discuss what exactly is the time frame for complete healing of hard and soft tissue. Sometimes it could reach up to six months. So it depends on the case. So always be careful when treating anterior cases. It needs time, it needs patience. Uh, which one is more uh, aesthetic using in veneer, lithium disilicate or low citrine force? 
Uh, for me, Lydian disilicate is the best glass ceramic for aesthetic uh, outcome. It has good uh, uh, translucency. Uh, it is a very nice material in terms of shade, color, and appearance. Uh, thank you for your outstanding lecture and great effort. Numerous magnificent cases by the residents. Uh, truly, I do acknowledge their hard work, uh, their compliance, and uh, their good cases. My question, what do you think of endocrown as a conservative treatment modality instead of the full coverage crown when the case, uh, when the case is applicable? Uh, uh, endocrown is being popular. Uh, it's gaining popularity again. It is one of the conservative means, especially if you have a case that you cannot achieve a fetal effect with a post and core and then for a crown. Or it's compromised in terms that you cannot do crown lengthening or period surgery uh, for that specific case. Yes, I would uh, go with endocrown if the case is uh, permissible. In case of attrition, is it right to do veneer or not? I already have uh, explained uh, this part. Uh, again, another question on endocrine. I already have answered that. Uh, digital dentistry nowadays has the best outcome regarding aesthetic. What is the next best option? As not every place has digital system to be used. My second question, what do you think about using PFM for anterior teeth? Uh, yes, digital dentistry is one of the uh, um, new technologies that being used. But it is really important to understand the basics. We always learn the basics and then we divert from the basics. So if you're in an area that does not have a, a digital component or you cannot use a digital component, still you could achieve good aesthetic results with the conventional way. Uh, can we uh, use PFMs for anterior teeth? Yes, definitely. We achieved uh, good aesthetic results with PFMs um, as a treatment modalities uh, in the past. You could have a porcelain margin, a shoulder in that area. You cut uh, your metal um, component during wax up and you could have your margins on uh, porcelain. But definitely the only uh, drawback for PFM is the translucency. When can I shift from temporary to permanent crowns and full mouth rehab cases? Usually we ask the patient to use these temporaries for uh, six to eight weeks and then we reevaluate. Why we can't use golden proportion as one of the aesthetic parameters? It has, it has been used and it was the golden uh, uh, um, uh, guidelines for uh, uh, using uh, uh, aesthetic parameters and evaluating smile. But the problem with golden proportion, it is a solid, rigid scientific measure. So it is not flexible. So nowadays we're, we're looking for more dynamic uh, uh, evaluation and treatment planning. Uh, role of the technician and the successes of your cases. Uh, definitely the technician has the highest success uh, uh, part in my uh, cases or in everyone's cases. The technician is the one who is fabricating your cases, whether the technician is doing it digitally or doing it conventionally. So having good communication with your technician, uh, sitting with your technician, uh, exploring with your technician different treatments and modalities, different materials, uh, the new blocks in the market, the new materials is really important. Uh, in the last two cases, you mentioned that patient perceived complete denture with lower RPD. In such a case, how will uh, we prevent the combination syndrome? Uh, yes, it is the combination syndrome. And we have specific guidelines and rules uh, when we're dealing with patients with combination syndrome. The easiest thing is to uh, provide the patient with a bilateral balance occlusion. Uh, when you do combine treatment, veneers, crowns, implants, I think it is difficult to choose the same shade for all of it. Is there a way or it is... Uh, by experience. Uh, the first thing or the first trick is to take one impression. Okay, so one impression for everything at the same time. And I have mentioned that previously. It will help uh, your technician to um, uh, build up everything in a good uh, proportion and it will help him to look at the shades when he's building. So when he, when he knows that he has an implant or uh, any kind of uh, uh, um, material that needs uh, more emphasis in shade, uh, this is going to be uh, important for him. The second thing is to choose your material. So you need to be very careful in selecting your material. Sometimes we combine zirconia with lithium disilicate. Sometimes we combine different kinds of materials together. 
but it's really important to know which material will be trans, uh, translucent, which materials will pass light, and you need to make sure that you inform your patients. And then we get to the next step if we need to do any kind of characterization. Is using an eye bar more aesthetic than a C-class? Uh, yes, uh, for, uh, uh, to an extent, because you're approaching your undercut from a gingival direction, so the display of metal is little. Okay, Assalamu uh, alaikum. I'm a from the Jamaat al Malik Saudi, and currently I'm a member of the Teachers in the Jamaat Tiba, and I studied in America. Honestly, I'm talking to my friends. It's really nice to see how strong the Saudi board is, and we may not need to send any more people outside one day. You are also a smart speaker and smart presenter, and know how to engage your audience. Your students are lucky to have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmed uh, from Tiba University. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the right name, uh, Ghazali. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, yes, prosthodontic residents are pretty much uh, talented. Uh, they're hard worker. Um, they're pretty much passionate. Uh, they're enthusiastic. Uh, I have been with them for almost more than three years now. Um, so whether they're in my training center or in different centers, they're putting a lot of efforts. They're trying to capture whatever information, information that they get. They're trying to uh, update themselves. Uh, yes, we do have a strong build-up structure of curriculum uh, based uh, with the help of um, Dr. Adnan Ashki, the chairman of the Scientific Council, and all the members, uh, all the program directors, uh, all the uh, local committees, it's a, it's a huge effort that was done by the Scientific Council to raise up the quality uh, of the uh, prosthodontic uh, uh, residency program. We have around 100 residents around the kingdom, and uh, hopefully, inshallah, we're going to see more to come. Can we consider for full acrylic RPD as a final prosthesis rather than metallic RPD? Um, no, for me, definitely no, because we have mechanics that we need to uh, uh, apply to our patients. When you're having a full acrylic RPD, you're missing some components uh, or some class components in your design. And the uh, uh, design for your RPD is important because you are distributing forces, you're counteracting rotational forces, uh, you're dissipating along the ax long axis of the tooth, uh, you're trying to break some stresses. So you cannot achieve that with acrylic RPDs. Do you still take face bow for all of the veneer cases? We do. We do take face bows, yes, we do. Although that there are a new literature talking about uh, the validity of face bow, but we still do. Um, I struggle with the aesthetic component of long span bridges. Is there anything I can do to assist my lab? Like in a combination treatment with veneers, it is more often that not the bridges are a different shade opacity in comparison to the veneers. I have answered that questions. Uh, hi, Dr. Ned, it's good to hear to hear your voice. This is one of my previous uh, residents. Very nice presentation, Dr. Raghda Shibani. Thank you so much, Dr. Raghda. And uh, she's in the States, and I wish her all the luck, inshallah. How do uh, veneer for patients with class three relationship, edge to edge bite, how to deal with the lateral incisal level? For me, if I have a skeletal problem or a patient in a class three, definitely I will ask for ortho consultation. Sometimes we could deal with these patients. If it's a minor class three, we could uh, try to overcome that. But if it's a, 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 a classical class three, maybe sometimes doing orthognathic surgery, combining other disciplines, uh, sometimes orthodontic treatment will help to achieve good aesthetic results. Uh, how can you deal with a patient with high expectation? Uh, it's important to explain to your patient. Uh, it is important to uh, uh, tell the patient exactly what the patient could expect because these patients are pretty much uh, precise in the information. Whenever you give them more information, they're gonna capture a part of your speech and they're gonna tell you, you told me that and you told me that. So you need to uh, try to make your patient more realistic. So uh, it's an art of communication to communicate with your patient, to make your patient more realistic, to understand the consequences. And if the patient agrees on the treatment, then pretty much okay. If not, then pretty much you could just um, uh, apologize from uh, this kind of treatment. Um, what I have seen through my experience, my short experience, is that 
patient needs someone to talk to them and explain to them. They need to be educated. And the problems that we are seeing uh, is that uh, the patients are not well taught or even uh, participated in the treatment plan. So that's why we get this negative uh, uh, feedback from those patients. Do you think cases underwent increasing vertical dimension will face TNG problems in the future? Uh, just to let you know that the cases that we have presented, not all of them had increased in vertical dimension. Some of them had only a gain of a lost restorative space. So not necessarily we are opening the bite, we are just gaining the lost space that the patient had previously. Uh, with good occlusal scheme uh, and good function and fabricating a well uh, uh, done prosthesis, you could guarantee the harmony of the uh, muscles of mastication and TNG. How can we achieve maximum aesthetic result in cases of complete denture and RPDs? Uh, the key factor in aesthetics of complete denture and RPDs is for you to sit in the lab, is for you to sit with your technician, for you to guide your technician, or sometimes you by yourself doing the cases. The cases that I have showed you for Dr. Uh, Anas Abu Hang and Dr. Anas Indijani, they worked on their case by themselves. They did the uh, wax up, the festooning, the build up. So they spent time working on their cases. So it is a matter of uh, being skillful, uh, spending time. The problem with us is that we always rely on technicians. And if we have problems, we blame the technician. And it should be the opposite way. We're the one who's supposed to guide the technician, uh, talk to the technician, communicate to the technician. We could do some modifications. Uh, you're the restorative dentist. Is it possible to do single veneer and have good aesthetic outcome? Yes. It is challenging, yes, but you could achieve that. Uh, your opinion for composite veneers? Um, I'm not an advocate for composite veneers, although that they have shown good success rate and survival rate. Uh, but for me, since I'm gonna do a preparation on the tooth, because when you're doing composite veneers, you're doing a minimal prep. I would rather go with porcelain. Uh, thank you so much. Would you would you like to uh, would like to know how to deal with patients who leaves the clinic is extremely happy with their veneers, but then in the 20 days or so they come and complain because their relatives told them about their veneers. Yes, what's happening nowadays when we talked about the lay people perception, uh, we talked about that uh, um, it's really important to know the patient's perception, and usually in the classic prosthodontic literature we always say that. Uh, we incorporate the relatives and family of completely dentureless patient because they're the one who's looking at the dentures. They're the one who are going to give comments. Nowadays, it's even for aesthetic cases. When you have aesthetic cases, it is important also to involve relatives, friends, a trusted member of a family uh, to be incorporated in the treatment plan because the patient will be happy about the aesthetic outcome, will be socially interactive, will be out in the public, and then he or she will be faced with uh, critiques. Someone will tell them that you have fake teeth, you have very white teeth, why does your tooth look like that? What, why, not, why does the shape of your tooth look this way? And then the patient will be disappointed. So it's really important to incorporate uh, family members or relatives or uh, friends that the patient trusts in the treatment plan. What is the best treatment for black triangles between the central incisors? Okay, when we're talking about black triangles, uh, as Tar now mentioned, and we all know, you need to measure the distance from the bone to the contact area. When we have a less than five millimeter space, then pretty much we ensure that the papilla will film the embrasure. Sometimes when we have more distance than that, you end up fabricating your prosthesis with a more wider contact area. So we know that the contact area in the central incisors almost as accounts for 50% uh, in the uh, contact point. So you could um, fill up the contact area more higher to give more illusion of a squeezed papilla. Okay, to choose composite video or ceramic one, I already have answered that. Um, one of the most difficult things is choosing the color shade. As I have mentioned previously, it depends on the light. Um, I have answered the endocrown also. Uh, what is the best treatment that could be done for multiple incipient caries in the anterior teeth with mild discoloration? Definitely composite restorations. 
um, does the skeletal relationship affect the denier's treatment plan? Sometimes, yes, especially if you have skeletal class two because they have exaggerated forces. So it's really important if you have any skeletal problems to take a lateral sift and discuss with the orthodontist prior to uh, planning your veneers. Does fluoride application affect the bonding strength of your veneers? It depends what kind of fluoride application are we talking about. Uh, when you're doing your uh, preparation and you're doing your veneers, there's no fluoride application, unless you're talking about sensitivity, and I already have uh, explained that. <clears throat> An edge to edge occlusion, would you advocate to do veneers for such patients? Uh, I'm going to be very careful in edge to edge uh, occlusion patients. Uh, do you still have time? Uh, one more question, Victor, if you. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, so basically, they're repetitive. Uh, Okay, the last question, what is your preferred material for posterior crowns, PFM or zirconia? For me, my golden standard is PFM. The second option is zirconia. Uh, thank you so much for attending the presentation. A lot of questions are there. Uh, I have tried my best to answer most of the questions. Uh, if you have any more questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact me on my email. Um, if, uh, and I encourage you all to uh, register uh, as members in the uh, Saudi Prosthodontic Society. Uh, we're going to have lots of uh, educational activities, uh, good um, membership benefits. Um, and please don't forget to answer the question uh, in our social media for you to win a free membership uh, in our society. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Doctora.